This week on Q&A, our guest is radio talk show host Laura Ingram. Laura Ingram, with all the media you've done, where would you rate your radio show? Uh, as far as more interest or interesting? Yeah, I mean, or? of all the things you've done, how, how do you put it on the scale of things you've enjoyed the most? The best. Uh, radio for me is what TV can't be because of the image. I mean, t television is great because you, you see the face, you see you know the way someone looks, you see the clothes. By the way, nice tie, Brian. Love it. Looks great. Um, the radio is just the voice, and it's it's what you do the theater of the mind with with the way you describe a scene or you you uh, mimic a voice or you play a soundbite. People in their car or listening at home, they have to pay attention because that's all they hear is the is the sound. And it's, there's none of the distracting images of television, which for me, uh, doing cable television, which I still occasionally do, uh, you miss. You, you miss people really riveted on the content. And uh, Larry King once said to me, he said, uh, Ingram, you're going to like radio better than anything you've ever done. And uh, Larry King was right. When did you start your show? I started in September of 2000 in, oh, excuse me, uh, April of 2001. I'm thinking of uh, September 11th doing the show that night, which was uh, amazing. That's when my show was on in the evening. I'm going to show a clip quickly so we can get the audience that's never heard you a sense of what you do on this show. Here it is. Thunder rumbles in the mountain passes and lightning rattles the eaves of our houses. Flood waters await in our avenues. It's the tsunami here and it's, it's New Orleans, it's a tsunami, it's global warming and it's all Bush's fault. Oh. I would have gotten an F for this poem if I submitted it in high school in my literat literature Yeah, class. no, we all would have failed. 800-876-4123. Should we do as Maya Angelou National Treasure, yes, no, or I don't know who she is, or should we do one word to describe? Oh, one word. One word? Yeah. Okay, and you also can call in about the Xerox Christmas letters, okay? Don't even think about calling in about the Pentagon paying people to write stories in Iraq. I don't care about that. I think it's <laughs> fine if we do that. By the way, my, my quote of the day on LauraIngram.com is from me. So fan, France announced that it did a, a successful face transplant. Now they need a spine transplant, and now <coughs> everything will be fine. All right, let's go to uh, let's go to line seven, Retta. Retta, your seven-year-old was just listening. What did she think? My son leaned over to me quietly, thankfully, and said, "She's awful." <laughs> How he's seven? Yeah, he's we seven. I lost, I lost her when she went into the Buddhist thing. Yeah, the Confucian and the Jainist. We Baptist yeah, and know. Buddhist. Yeah, well, you know, by the way, she refers to the Jainism, which is the ascetic religion of India, founded in the 6th century B.C. that teaches the immortality and transmigration of the soul and denies the existence of a perfect or supreme being. How many of those Jainists do you think were on, in the crowd at the, uh, at the ellipse, ellipse at the, at, in Washington? Well, that we taped a couple of days ago. Uh, what are you doing there? Well, there was a um, moment at the Christmas, or can we call it Christmas still, Brian? Do you call it Christmas on, on C-SPAN? A pageant of peace in Washington when the lighting of the Christmas tree. And I don't know, I thought Maya Angelou had gone away with the Clinton administration, but apparently she's still reading, I guess, what can be called poetry. There's no rhyming involved, but... She was scaring small children, as far as I could tell, in the crowd by talking about the waters filling the streets of, I guess, New Orleans. And I was wait, waiting to see when it was going to get around to peace or the Christmas tree or anything, but it, it took a while. We just thought it was humorous. I think those moments, those cultural moments, are, can provide great belly laughs. And I know there are probably a lot of Maya Angelou fans watching, and I'm sure she's a really nice lady, but not a fan of the poetry. You talked about, say, are we going to do the one word description? Description or what right. was the other technique? Uh, one word description of Maya Angelou or whether she's a national treasure or not or do you not know who she is? And that's how we started off one hour. Some, radio is it, sometimes we, we produce a lot of sound bites. I mean, this is a packet of sound bites for a daily show. There's all these tabs of all these things people say, Mayor Nagin, John McCain, Mirtha, all these people. And sometimes I'll just walk in and throw the, throw the thing to the side and say, did anyone see Maya Angelou at the Christmas, the Christmas pageant? Because for me, it was, it was something about that moment got me going. And if I'm interested in a subject, I can often, I hope always, but not always, often make it interesting for the people listening. So I thought it was funny. How many cities in America can hear your show? Uh, we're on 340 stations uh, nationwide. What time of day? 
Um, the show is live on 9 a.m. to noon East Coast, and any station can run at any time of the day. Some choose to run it live, others delay it. So um, depending on what time zone you're in, you can drive around in your car and you'll hear it at different times throughout the country. Between the websites that you have and listening to you on the radio, you tell the audience almost everything about yourself. I do. Um, radio, I think, doesn't work if you don't bring in part of your own personal experiences. Over the weekend, I went to see um, a special screening of the C.S. Lewis movie, uh, Narnia, The Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe. And I happened to, to go with eight or nine kids. And I, I like telling those stories because it, 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 people you know, want to know that you're a real person, that you have real fears, you have real problems. You're coping with a lot in addition to trying to do a daily show. And I think, for me, people notice uh, and remember that stuff when I go across the country. Um, they, always say, they always say, hey, Laura, how's Troy doing? And I'm thinking, oh, my God, how does this person know the name of my dog? And I'm like, oh, yeah, I talk about it on my show. Of course they know the name of the dog. But they remember that stuff. And I think it, bring, it draws the audience closer to you. They know about your cancer? They do. Um, on April, I think it was April 23rd. Uh, I should know the date. Um, April 23rd of this year, I, before I went into a surgery, um, first surgery I had for, to remove a, a 9 millimeter tumor, I called into my show because someone had to host it for me because my surgery was to start at the same time my show. And I had known for a few days and didn't tell, um, didn't tell anything uh, to the audience. So I called in and I said, well, guys, this is a, an unusual opening uh, for the show, but I had this little issue crop up. And um, I, I asked for people's prayers because it was a, it was a hard time. Um, I didn't disguise the fact that it was a hard time. I, I don't like talking about myself, and I don't want to be identified as a, as a cancer person. But I got to tell you, I'm glad I asked for prayers because people, uh, I felt so blessed for the last several months. It was a, a tough several months, but people put me on prayer lists, community prayer groups. I received prayer cards, nuns. Uh, people from all faiths, and, and it really was amazing. So selfishly, uh, I feel like I shared that story because I needed help, and and it, it it brought me back down. I think to where sometimes we forget when we're in the media, where we are, which is just like everybody else. You told him about your fiance. I did. Yeah. And he, then he's no longer your. Fiance. Yeah. It's you know the th thing about being in the public eye, which. Um, I know that you, that you you also have to deal with is it's wonderful because people come up to you and they say hi I love what you do or sometimes they don't like what you do and that's that's nice and and it's it's wonderful it's a blessing but sometimes when when things happen which aren't pleasant and are are unhappy you know by by the fact of your personality or your celebrity you have to share that and so I decided to you know share the fact that you know I, I was engaged a couple weeks uh, earlier and then was uh, unengaged a couple weeks into the cancer, but it, it you know it was for the best, and he's actually a good guy and and uh, love his family, so we're we're uh, we're we're both good. Let me show another little snippet from your show. Sure. Why is she picked to do this poem? Why is she representative? I never heard of this woman. I mean, for the whole year, and now she's doing this awful poem. Well, Jerry, you missed her at the Clinton inauguration in '92. Don't you remember Maya Angelou got up there and it was missed us. Frog, stand on my back. <laughs> Up to the sun, the sun, Mr. Frog, the sun. Don't you remember that? Or frog or turtle? Mr. Turtle, get on my back. Don't you remember that well, poem? Uh, she shows up for inaugurations and uh, events like this. I don't get it. Somebody makes these decisions. I'd like to know who it well, is. Well, I mean, why do we have to inherit Maya? I'm sure she's a nice woman, but she was Clinton's poet laureate, wasn't she? I and mean, now she's Hallmark's. Now she, she works for Hallmark. Mm -hmm. I mean, let, we could do a Christmas poem better than that. Let's go to uh, line 10. Tom, what do you have in common with Maya? Unfortunately, I know what a Jane is as well, but uh, how scary is that? Uh, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Let's go to line four, Rich. Uh, I'm discombobulated, Laura. I have nothing in common with that. Uh, I wish for your poll question you would add another category that Yes, I knew who Maya Angelou is. If you think she's an American treasure, great. I don't care. Yeah, all right. And you're talking there about a poll. Right. Where is that done? We have a, a website, lauraingram.com, which, um, which we have a poll question every day. It usually has something to do with politics, the culture, something we've covered on the show. And, 
that particular one was about Maya Angelou. Everyone's going to think all we talk about is Maya Angelou with these clips. I mean, we don't just talk about... Well, I wondered if there is an right. underlying kind of a political theme to this. Right. Is there? Oh, Maya Angelou? No, not really. I just think it's, I think it's funny that in the culture and in, in, in music and in film, sometimes people become brands without any sort of verifiable talent. And it's going to, and I'm not applying it to Maya Angelou, it's just whether it's music or film or it, you're famous because you're famous. And I think that that's amusing. And I think a lot of people don't really pay attention to that, whether it's someone like a Jessica Simpson or, or any of the kind of modern pop icons today. And, and we, on our show, try to combine politics, the culture, focusing on what happens in the media. By the way, I'm, I'm calling Queer Eye for the straight guy. They're coming in and doing this set over. Poinsettias. We need a line of white poinsettias on this set. I mean, I know this is not for profit, but uh, can, we can do something about this. You set. don't like our set? No. There's, uh, where, did you get this at Marlowe Furniture? Where'd you? This was inherited from my old MSNBC set. I, I saw that with, upstairs. What's wrong a, with Marlowe Furniture? Nothing. But I, I uh, nothing. You're, I, I stand corrected. If you get on the Google and put your name in, you find some interesting things. Oh God, here we go. Have you ever done it? Uh, I don't Google myself, but do you do? Do you Google yourself? No, but I did, I Googled you. Oh great. This is an article from 1997 by Eric Alterman. Oh yeah, my friend. He and I are. Do you remember this? Very close. You remember this article? I remember somewhat. We worked together at MSNBC. He was talking about an interview you did with Shimon Peres. I didn't interview him. I think he came on MSNBC when we were sitting around in a round table. And you were talking about, uh, Laura wanted to know if Paris thought it was a good idea for the U.S. to bomb Syria and Libya in response. Remember that story back in the 90s? I sort of do. Then, not... then he says, Paris clearly thought she was nuts and did his best to explain that no one even knew if foul play had been involved yet. Mm. Two words, Eric Alterman. And, and Didn't he do a book called Punditocracy after making did. like millions off of the being a pundit? Uh, I don't know. But what is it like? I mean, you, you do you throw things around sure. like that, and then he throws them back. Yeah, you dish you. it out. You got to take it. I mean, uh, since I was in college, when I was editing at a conservative um, newspaper at Dartmouth, I mean, we were as student journalists, we were being threatened by by professors. We were threatened with disciplinary action by the college. I mean, uh, this is just. It's par for the course, and I don't, you know, I grew up with three brothers. They're pretty rough and tumble, so it doesn't really bother me. Did a professor sue you? Yes, he did. Professor Cole, William Cole. This is my first introduction to the legal system in the United States. I was a sophomore at Dartmouth, and I'd written an article about his music class where I made the mistake of quoting him at length, and I, I attended a couple of his classes auditing them. And so I quoted him at length, and it was called Professor Cole's Song and Dance Routine. I still remember the title. And he sued me, Dinesh D'Souza, who was the editor of the Dartmouth Review at the time, and a couple of others for, I think it was only like $2.4 million. My mother, who was a waitress until she was 73, was, said, how, how, much, how much have we been sued for? And all, it, it, a couple of years later, it uh, went away. Nothing, nothing Completely happened. Completely went away? Yeah, I think it was, I think we had a dollar settlement or something. I don't, I don't know what happened. But we had a big New York law firm represented us pro bono. It was an early case of kind of conservative students taking on the liberal faculty establishment at a, at a college. And in my mind, winning because it was, it, it, you know, we published a weekly newspaper that was independent of the school. And we were irreverent and often sophomoric, but we... Uh, you know, we, we made a difference, and I love seeing students making a difference and, and on college campuses that are supposed to be places where free exchange of ideas take place, except when you happen to be a conservative and you're trying to make a point. So the review is a good training ground. Can you put a finger on where you learned to be a conservative, where you felt like you were a conservative? My best memory of w when it really seemed solid, most solid in my mind, was when I was in high school during the election, I think it was ninth grade in, in the election of, of Ronald Reagan, 1980. Um, the college cafeteria, the, the high school cafeteria at Glastonbury High School, it was, uh, we had a election night party and there were all these tables for Jimmy Carter. There were, I think, two tables. Out of, we have a big class, 430 in my class. There were two tables for Reagan. And the best as I can recall, it was a bunch of math geeks 
and then it was me and a couple of other people. And I'll, I'll never forget watching the returns come in. And a number of the, of the teachers were really bummed out. And I remember getting on the table and just going, yes! Like, I just, just pumped my fist and go, yes! And it was just a great... That and Bucky Dent hitting the, hitting the home run over the Green Monster and, you know, the big playoff with the Yankees was the best, best moments I remember in high school. Why conservative, though? My parents were kind of... Uh, had grown up conservative, but not all that political. My father uh, was an engineer at Pratt & Whitney, and my mom, as I said, was a, was a waitress and a homemaker. And they weren't really that political. My brothers aren't political. But I don't know. I somehow, uh, I gravitated toward it because it seemed to me to make the most sense. It seemed to me the way of looking at the world that gave the most power to the people and not to, not to big bureaucratic institutions. And Reagan really spoke to me uh, that age. And I think, the, you know, the city of Washington is filled with people my age, you know, now you know, 40 and above, who they wouldn't be here if it weren't for Reagan. He really changed the political landscape and gave us all a sense that, wow, we don't have to feel bad that we're Americans. We don't have to live like this. We can actually be proud of our military, proud of where we, uh, we've come from, and proud of our traditions and fair and fair to the people who need help and and it, we can still be conservative and feel that way so you've radio show for the last couple of years you know, what 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 is in your mind when you think about the audience and how do you put it together day to day because you from watching you you clearly have to be up all the time yeah um i have uh, i have to say that it's a team effort you know matt fox lee habib uh, lee is the executive producer of the show matt is uh, indispensable um, uh, producer on the show. Matt is an absolute whiz on the digital sound editing board. I think he's the best in the United States in radio. Lee went to law school with me and he and I used to talk late, you know, late at night on the phone. We'd be like, did you watch that Brian Lamb interview he was doing the other night? God, did he blow it with uh, Justice Breyer. No, I'm just kidding. It was, but yeah, that was, you know, we'd be watching something on television and Lee would say, Oh, Charlie Rose and, and Sting, are they loving it? They're in love with each other. This interview is so cozy. So we'd have a running commentary, like on the, on the phone at midnight, we would just be laughing. So how do you get the sound bites then? From oh, the then, but, but that was before the show started. And then, we, then when I decided to do the show, I thought Lee was the person to do it with me because we were on the same track of looking at the culture and politics. No, but I mean, how do you get the sound bites from the shows and you put them on your, you know, the little clips and yeah, people seem to be doing more and more of that. Right. Digital um, sound editing is has changed uh, talk radio, at least it's changed our show. I mean, when we first started out trying radio, we had we actually used a, a tape machine, like the old big reels. And and now it's all done with a cool edit program that where the wire goes right into your um, computer from the television and you can you have big sound wave files, and you take little snippets out, and and then you organize them. That's why I held up this thing because this is this is a lot of pages. This is like probably 30 pages of sound um, for just one day. We've got and it's some tape before the programs over of a couple of interns sitting there and somebody in the back looking at television sets and all that. Do you record everything? We record a lot. Um, without, by the way, without uh, C-SPAN we wouldn't have as much material as we have because what C-SPAN has done for us is provide uh, a look into things like these, some of the anti-war rallies in Washington, uh, the speeches at the State of the Black Union uh, conference that's done every year, uh, debate between or discussion with, uh, with Stephen Breyer and Justice Scalia about foreign law and whether it's appropriate. I mean, you, you, you might not think that that would make people stop and listen on the radio. But as, as C-SPAN did it on television, we try to take a, a, a lot of the great stuff that you and, and then even CNN or MSNBC Fox finds and, and cull it together in a way that tells a narrative that speaks to the people and, 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 and maybe makes them laugh a little. Laughing's important to the show, Brian. And learning. We got, I told you I would get you to laugh. I've gotten to, you to laugh five times on this, on this show already, so I've already won our bet. All right. So that's how we do it. So, how did you know you had a hit? Um, with the show, well, we—I still don't—I I still don't know if we have a hit. I mean, I think we, uh, our show's done well, and we continue to try to do new things with it and change it and confuse people. Some days, well, I'll come in and we won't have any guests, and we'll just, you know, we'll just riff for three hours with ratings? the listeners. 
we do ratings go market to market, and you know some some markets you do great, other markets you know you you aren't doing as well as you thought. It depends on what station you're on in a market. You know, radio is changing a lot, like television. It's it's changing with with satellite traditional radio, and then people are streaming on the internet. So there's three things converging. And you charge for the internet. Yes. Is that we a do. profit center for you? Uh, a little bit. It, ta it costs a lot to stream the show and then to archive 30 days of it. We have 30 days of the show, like you guys have. Um, you guys have have, have C-SPAN on, you know, all the time, where people can go back and look at things. It's not cheap to do that and to maintain it, and and so uh, we couldn't do it for free. We are a we are a profit-making enterprise. Go back to when it all started. How did your radio program begin? Uh, I was at MSNBC and then no longer at MSNBC. I was not renewed. This was in the summer of 2000. They tell you why? Not really. You had, you had your own show every day. Yeah, I had my own show, but then they, they canceled that in January of 98. We started it in August 96. We were the first show. Uh, Watch It with Laura Ingram was the first show that MSNBC did out of Washington. And I'll have you know that we had no teleprompter for the first few months. We had an easel. And I still have that easel at home. I never gave it away with paper. That my, my producer would flip, Leah Mako would flip. And, would, and, and they would have, have the topics of the day. And so I just riff for an hour and would have guests. And it was fun. It was, it was a great time. We tried to do a, like a mini interview, a little bit like the Daily Show. Kind of, would have separated at birth. I mean, it was random. It was, it was, it was odd. Very ambitious and, and a lot of fun. But they canceled that um, in January of 2000, right? You know, as the election was really heating up, I was pleased about that. Uh, but that's kind of the way MSNBC goes. You know, they're, you're on for, we were on for a good while for MSNBC uh, standards. And so then uh, we did some, did some pieces for them as a kind of a roving commentator, analyst, reporter kind of thing for maybe six months. And then I decided, you know something, radio is where I feel most, um, most like myself. And I miss in the morning. Don Imus really is, he probably hates to hear this, but he's really responsible for my radio show. If it weren't for him, uh, obviously Rush Limbaugh is the person who started this whole thing with the conservative talk radio. I wouldn't be doing it, but I used to do these monthly appearances on Imus' show, and I had so much fun. And most of it was joking around with him, teasing him, you know, him te his, his teasing me back, and it, was, it could get pretty vicious, but funny. And I noticed when I would go around the country giving speeches, people would say, oh, Laura, I loved what the, when you told Don, Emma, Don Imus he looked like Mrs. Doubtfire. That was really funny or something like that. And I didn't even remember saying anything like that. But I noticed that people remembered the humor part of it. And so when I thought about what I would do next, I knew I wouldn't go back and be a lawyer again because I just I didn't care for that. But I thought, you know something, I might try this radio thing. And it, people laughed. They said, you're never, you can't start a show from nothing. It's not going to happen. But... Uh, at the time, Westwood One took a chance on me, and uh, Joel Hollander, who was running Westwood One, and he said, we have a slot at night from 7 to 10, and I kind of went, uh, night. I was bummed because it was 7 to 10 at night, but it was an amazing opportunity, and they gave me a great opportunity, and we did that for about two years, and then I, I wanted to move the show to the morning because I'm a morning person, and uh, Mark Masters of Talk Radio Network uh, bought our show, and he just took it from a small show to a very, you know, in the, in the rankings of radio, we've done well. And it's in two short years, really. Where are morning. you in the ratings nationally? I think we're about, uh, last time it was done, I think we're about five, number five. So, you know, Rush and Hannity are, you know, are huge. And Howard Stern, obviously, legendary, huge. Uh, Michael Savage, and uh, I think we're somewhere in that that ranking. I think the top five, if I'm, I might be wrong, but I think that's right. So is there a serious purpose behind all this? Yeah, I, I what we try to do on a, on a daily basis is hope, I hope we help people learn a little bit about something they might not have already known. Sometimes political, maybe it's a great book, um, whether it's this new biography on the Beatles that Bob Spitz just wrote, which is fantastic, or whether it's a person named uh, John Croyle from the Big Oak Boys Ranch, who could have been a pro football player, instead decided to take care of kids for the last 25 years, or whether it's pointing out uh, something Dick Durbin that was outrageous, something he said about Pol Pot and our troops. 
uh, we try to, you know, we try to give people a sense that there's a place you can go, and we we will try to respect your intelligence and your values, and remember where we came from, and never get to that place where I think I'm better than any of the people listening to my show. Um, so serious to give people a sense that they can call in and they actually have a home on our show, and we love to we love to highlight the troops, and we we're talking to a lot of the troops in Iraq in the last uh, three or four weeks. And uh, I get teared up. I get, uh, it's very emotional for me to talk to these, to these men and women. And I've, I've, I've uh, a couple times on my show, I've, I have not made it through a segment because uh, it's tough. You know, it's tough to, to hear about their sacrifices and, and hear about the fact that uh, they don't feel supported by some of the things that are said these days. What kind of a grade would you give George Bush? Oh gosh, I'm not a good grader. Uh, on uh, I, I don't feel like I'm um, I'm in a position to grade George Bush. I think that history will tell. This this situation in Iraq is obviously difficult. I think if it turns out to um, be a success five years back, look, looking at the way things develop, he will people will be calling George Bush a uh, a genius. If it continues to become difficult, progress is not made, then that will be, you know, his presidency. This is going to be all on Iraq, his presidency. And that people might say that's not fair, but, you know, when you have uh, 2,100 uh, men and women who have lost their lives and a lot of our national treasure going to fight this war, it is the big kahuna when it comes to this administration. I think he's a bold and uh, courageous president in many ways. I think that he hasn't been out ahead of the curve PR-wise on branding this war and branding this effort, making people understand why it's best for us here in this country to be fighting that war. A lot of conservatives who talk to me are, are frustrated because they think, why is it that you know, like internet bloggers and talk radio and cable television hosts are, 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 are doing this work for the administration in many ways? I mean, talking about what the, the importance of the war on terror. I think now you're seeing the administration do a much be aggressive and do a much better job. Um, that was the duck of the day, by the way. I didn't answer the question on grading George Bush. I don't feel I I don't think I think those are kind of silly questions. Great. I don't know. We'll see how he does. Well, the reason I ask is uh, compare him with uh, Ronald Reagan and your beliefs in Ronald Reagan. Are, do you have the same beliefs in George Bush? See, Reagan, to me, I think it was a different time. It's almost not fair to compare Bush to Reagan. I mean, we're all looking for the next Reagan and. There's, there's not going to be another Elvis. <laughs> there's not going to be another Reagan. I mean, they're, they're, the different times work, require different things of our leaders. And I wish that, you know, George Bush had the, it had the ability to, uh, to rally the troops, not the military, but the conservative troops, in the same way that Ronald Reagan did. But then again, Ronald Reagan was only one of the best communicators of our time, so it's not fair. And I think, I think there have been moments where George Bush just hits it out of the park. And I, I introduced him at a at a rally in um, MC to rally in St. Paul, Minnesota during the campaign. There were fifteen thousand people in this in, in in indoor stadium. And I'll tell you something. He has enormous talent when it comes to talking directly to the people. He doesn't like talking to the media so much, but when he's talking directly to the people, he connects and and. You know, I think this war in Iraq is, is, I think, made it much more difficult for him on the domestic level, on a lot of his domestic programs, Social Security, just, I mean, that went down the, the, the tubes early on, and we'll see about, you know, where he, you know, what progress he makes in some other area. It's just, it's, you know, it's tough when you're, you're down at 37% in the polls. It's hard to get anything done. Let's watch some more of the tape from your no, show. No, more Maya Angelou. More, yeah, no, I'm sick of this now at this point. All right. Now, I, I asked Lee when, when we had Major Garrett booked, I said, he better be coming into the studio, right? And, and we have our C-SPAN cameras here because they're going to do a sit-down, hour sit-down with Brian Lamb uh, and is going to interview me for an hour on Monday. It's going to run on the 11th, December 11th. We'll put it up on the website. And so I think, wait, they're doing all this B-roll of our studio. We've never let a camera into the studio, ever. It's we don't like sanctum. it. And I thought, why isn't Garrett, why isn't Major Garrett in here? Otherwise when, known as Major. Otherwise known as Major in here for this uh, extravaganza. And then, like, boom, I say it and you walk in. You're here. You seek, I deliver. But, by the way, um, one word to describe Maya Angelou. It's hyphenated, but it's still one word. Chronic fatigue syndrome. <laughs> I don't need sentimentality. Oh. 
Well, she did this thing, Major, not to not to uh, veer away from the what important uh, that, stuff that you cover, but she did this thing at the oh, Pageant please, of veer. Peace. The Pageant of Peace. The, she was the biggest downer at the Pageant of Peace. She was talking about the floodwaters swallowing us all up, and and it was just such a negative. Listen to the music. Thunder rumbles in the mountain passes, and lightning rattles the eaves of our houses. Flood waters await in our avenues. Uh, this is this, but the kids were crying, as far as I could tell. Yes, because one of the kids, I'm sure, wrote something very similar for a fourth grade essay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So I saw, I turned on Fox last, la, over the weekend. You're a big fan of mine. I thought we got rid of her with the Clinton administration, but apparently she's still out there working for Hallmark. You making know, making tons of money, my my dad. She's, like, she's a nice woman, I'm sure. She's a very nice woman. But she's just I, a downer. I just think you need to elevate a little bit. I mean, bit. come on. A little rhyming on occasion would be good. Just an iambic pentameter or two or three. A countervailing thought, uh, a continuation of a thought, not just yeah, one no, repetitive yeah. word. Remember when the Clinton administration was like, Water. Mr. Brown. Again, you're going to think, people are going to think all I talk about is Maya Angelou. By the way, I love Maya Angelou. I take it all back. She's, she should be our permanent poet laureate. D does it ever, I mean, here you are looking at yourself when you did this. We're out of context with when it happened and yeah. all that. Does I should have let you guys stay for the whole three hours. Didn't I kick you out after you one did, hour? Yeah. See, that's my, it's, I'm to blame. But you did say that this is the first time cameras had ever been yes. in this. Why is it? I don't know. It's, it's. Something, it's just like when cameras are, cameras were allowed in the House of Representatives, people start giving speeches. And oddly enough, that is the way we do the show. It's kind of rollicking. And we don't usually focus on Maya Angelou for the hour. But it's, cameras can change the way people are. And our show's very organic. And with a camera on you, you just, you don't feel the same. It's Give me an example different. of... of why? We've, we've got some video on there yeah. that's shot to the glass from the control room right. so people can see. Oh, I'm dancing there. Oh, good. I'm doing like an Ellen DeGeneres dance. And Fantastic. Your, Matt, your Matt Fox is right in the picture Matt, here. there's Matt. There's his hand. Oh, wait. There's his head. Oh, he needs a shave in the back of that neck. Oh, he's looking good. So he, 25 years old, talented boy. Lee is, I don't know where Lee went. Lee's Heather is gone, behind too. him, yeah. Oh, Lee's standing behind. Um, yeah, I just, we've, we've been asked about putting a camera in the studio. You know, I still, I still uh, toy with the idea of uh, going back to television. I'm not, I'm not ruling anything out at this juncture, but I, I'm not a hanker, I'm not just uh, hungering to have a camera. On that. But how does television change once a camera comes in? And well, you... they're looking at, you know, Brian, for your cameras, just for you, for Brian Lamb. By the way, your name, Wolf Lamb Jack, is out. Everyone knows now. He, his nickname is Wolf Lamb Jack, because of your radio um, career in college. Um, because because the cameras are in there, people are looking. Okay, did she did she have makeup on? With her hair? What is she wearing? You know, the studio. Look, all the studio is a mess. There's things all over on the floor. We don't even have things hung up in our studio. If we had a camera in there, we'd have to worry about you know paper on the floor. Uh, floor. Everything's a mess. Well, when Don Imus first went on simulcasting, they let it alone, left it alone, and now he's moved to the studio. Yeah. And no, I would never. I, I would. I would. I. No, I couldn't. I. I don't think cameras will. I shouldn't say that. Watch cameras be in there next week. So now you've gotten me all thinking about this. I don't know. Somehow it's just our little, it's our little place where we do our show and it's a little mystery surrounding it. Now you've ruined the whole mystery. Now you alluded to this earlier. You've been, you were graduate of University of Virginia Law School. Yes. And then you were a Ralph Winter. Yes. Uh, what, what, what circuit? Federal Second Court circuit? of Appeals for the Second Circuit. Second Ralph Cir K. Winter, one of the great uh, legal giants. You were great, great man. I was, yes. What year was it? That was 91, uh, 92 when I graduated. And then Clarence Thomas on the Circuit Court? Uh, Supreme Court. On the, when he was at the Supreme Court? Yes, 92, 93. And you've come all the way from that kind of experience isn't to that, radio. Yeah, isn't that funny? I was talking to uh, Justice Thomas about this and we were laughing about how I'm this only, you know, all these other clerks have gone on to become law professors at top universities and be these high-powered attorneys working in the Solicitor General's office in the Justice Department. And I'm doing this daily radio show where, you know, we do what we do. And it's, I don't know, it just, it just happened that way. It was, the, it was one of the best jobs I've ever had, both working for Judge Winter and working for Justice Thomas. I always felt like I was, uh, uh, I was the person who somehow got hired and was not supposed to be there because I was surrounded by all these incredibly brilliant uh, young legal minds. Um, each each justice has four clerks, and it's a real, you know, small group of people. With it, we have a lot of responsibility, 
and uh, it was great. It was for it was for a year, and it's, I can't believe how long ago it was now, but it was a lot of fun. I asked Justice Breyer whether the court should go on television, and now that you've been inside as a clerk and seen it, and no. we've talked about television, should it go on television? No, I don't. I agree with Justice Scalia. I think Justice Scalia has said he was uh, he was not in favor of that. I think I think what hap tends to happen with the cameras is that people showboat for the camera, and that just it's kind of human nature a little bit. I don't think we need that on the court. We can, we can, you guys can do that mischief with, are you going to have another C-SPAN channel just for the court? Don't I know that's it. what you're doing. Don't need it. We can, you know, they only have 80 arguments a year, an hour each, that's 80 hours, there's plenty of time. Yeah, you can, that's true. I still think you guys should do a reality show for your life. That would be the best thing. C-SPAN 5, Brian Lamb gets dressed in the morning, eats his cereal. That would be something you guys should yeah, do. Total ratings flop. Now I'll go back to Supreme Court yep. clerk, practice law. Yes, I worked at Skadden Arps in uh, Washington. It's a big New York firm, but it has a pretty big Washington office. I work for Bob Bennett. I'm the only person alive, I think, who worked for both Bennett brothers. Bill Bennett, when he was Secretary of um, Education, I worked for his undersecretary, Gary Bauer, at the time. And then I worked for Bob Bennett at Skadden, who was uh, one of the top partners in white collar criminal defense. So I was defending all these wrongly accused corporations. And so what are you learning all through this process about the law? I, at, at Skadden, I think I, I learned that you shouldn't get accused of anything because if you're just accused, it can ruin your life. And that's the unfortunate situation we have with, with the way our, our system works is that, you know, it works most of the time. But as you can see with some of these big prosecutions, and I won't name names, but big, you know, big, huge prosecutions going on now, the, the instinct is you know, to indict, accuse, drop a subpoena, it, turn your life, your business upside down. Maybe a few months later, they'll decide, oh, no, there's nothing here. And remember the old line, where do you go to get your reputation back? It's, uh, it's not easy. So that's why we have Skadden Arps and all these other law firms out there. There's a lot of work to be done because there's a lot, you know, there are a lot of these investigations going on and obviously some of them are absolutely necessary and critical, but we, we live in a litigious society. Everybody's suing everyone else and, and I think uh, we have too many lawsuits and probably too many lawyers. So I thought it was a good thing for me to reduce that number. You mentioned earlier your mother being a waitress till she was 73. Did she die when she was 73? No, she was 79 uh, six years ago. Uh, my mom passed away of lung cancer. And uh, it was th that, that I think was for me harder than getting cancer myself. And the only saving grace <laughs> of my mother dying was that she didn't have to see me diagnosed because, you know, a mother seeing a child, I think that is so hard and she would have, you know, she would not have uh, had a good time throughout that. But yeah, she, she was diagnosed um, in October of 1998 and died in May of 1999. And she was very healthy and fit. My mother was a riot. You would have loved her, Brian. Actually, she did like you. She used to watch you. I'm remembering now. She liked you. You would have liked my mother. She's about five feet tall and packed a punch. And you say she was a waitress until she was She was. Years? Willie's Steakhouse in Manchester, Connecticut, also the Golden Goblet in Glastonbury. And also, she ladled out food at my elementary school, which uh, when I was uh, in kindergarten and first grade, my mom worked in the cafeteria. Why would she work that hard with her, uh, her husband at Pratt & Whitney? Well, my dad was, you know, he did, he did well at Pratt & Whitney, but, you know, we weren't, we didn't, you know, we weren't rich. And uh, she, we had th she had three older, I have three older brothers. And, you know, putting them all through school, um, tip money came in handy. So we lived in you know, one bathroom house and two bedrooms for all these, uh, all these kids. So it was, uh, it was crowded. Is your dad still alive? He is. And uh, he's, he has been incredibly supportive of me and my career and is insanely uh, proud and, uh, you know, watches. And I know he'll be watching. Hi, Dad. And... Your brothers, where are they? My brother Jimmy uh, works at MIT. He's a smarty pants. Uh, he lives up in uh, Massachusetts. My brother Curtis, who is hysterically funny and also just so brilliant. He's a uh, teacher in San Francisco, teaches math and uh, French. And my brother Brooks teaches English in Seoul, Korea. And he's coming home for Christmas, and I haven't seen him in three years, so I'm happy that, that Brooks is coming home. And what impact did they have on you when you were growing up? They were just there for me. Um, 
I was a lot younger than my next youngest brother, uh, seven years, uh, although everyone says Curtis looks younger than I do, and it's really irritating. I was like, how much younger is your brother than you? It's like, um, but they were, they were just there for me, and, and uh, I was a bit of a tomboy, and always getting into some type of, you know, altercation with someone, verbal or otherwise, so my brothers were always there to tease me or make it worse. No, they were, we had, we had fun. My oldest brother, Jimmy, was uh, 11 years older than I, uh, than I, so he was out of the house, you know, pretty soon, and I, I think I cried for three months when my brother, Jimmy, went to college. What's your own prognosis for your cancer? It's good. Uh, they caught the cancer, thank goodness, um, stage one. I went in to get an exam, and I hadn't been in, like, a complete and utter moron. I hadn't been to the doctors in three years, and just doing an exam, and everything looked great. And then he said, I feel a little something. Uh, I'm sure it's nothing. And th th these little blessings happen along the way. This, Dr. Russell Bridges in Washington, and if, if he didn't find it, I don't, I, don't know if, I don't know if I'd be here today or not, but... He found it, and I went and got an ultrasound, and didn't show up on a mammogram. Went and got an ultrasound, and it looked like a little lima bean. And the and the radiologist looked at it, said, "Laura, I I think it's a fibroadenoma. It's it's probably nothing." But I I decided to opt for a biopsy. Got a biopsy, and uh, I was leaving for the weekend uh, to go on a retreat. And uh, Friday afternoon, I kind of checking my messages really quickly, I was running out of the studio, and I checked to like, uh, Laura, this is Dr. You know, Choi, and um, uh, can you call me back? And I almost dropped the phone. It was one of those things when your heart starts to boom, 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 boom. And I, and I was on instant message with my friend Pat Cipollone, who's also my godfather, one of the most brilliant lawyers in Washington. I, I emailed him. I said, Pat, I, I think this is bad news. And he said, no, it's fine, it's fine. And he was trying to... And then I, I called her and she said, you have uh, invasive ductal carcinoma. And I said, can I have a translation on that, Doc, please? i got to buy a vowel on what that is. She said, you have breast cancer. And I said, okay. And I, I didn't say anything, but I hung up. And Lee was and Matt were still in the other room. Your producer producers. and your technical Yeah, support. both producers were in the other room. And I just, tears started coming down my eyes, my, my cheeks. And Lee ran in. And he said, what the heck happened? And I told him. And then kind of my whole world changed. And so friends, Cipollone. You know, my, you know, all my friends, uh, my then fiance, they all converge on this studio and then we developed a battle plan. And um, it's, I had such great friends, Brian. Uh, the, my friends were, uh, and, and my family obviously, were just amazing. They, people scheduled uh, times to be with me during chemotherapy. Uh, I got emails from women all across the country who have had much worse situations than I, who cheered me on and said, don't you think about quitting your radio show this summer? You're going to fight on. You're gonna... And I said, you know, darn it, not I'm only, only going to fight on, but I'm not going to ball. I'm not going to say why me. And I tried to just, I don't know, put one foot in front of the other. And there were, there were dark days. Um, but it was, uh, it, was, it, it was a blessing in more ways, oddly, than it was a negative. And it, this all started in April. It started end of, end of April, yeah. And it, uh, it, my treatment ended in the uh, middle of October. One of the notes in your past is that you converted to Catholicism in 2003? Uh, I did, yeah. Pat Cipollone, who I just mentioned, um, who is a partner at Kirkland & Ellis Law Firm and an old friend of mine, I went to have lunch with him. He w had been general counsel of the Knights of Columbus. And I really, you know, I had gone to Catholic Mass uh, off and on and, and just was open to, you know, different faiths. And I went to Episcopal Church. I kind of sampled a lot of um, a lot of services, and but I had, my mom was Polish, and she grew up Catholic. I wasn't raised Catholic. I was raised Northern Baptist, and a little church in Glastonbury, Connecticut. And it, I don't, I, I haven't written about this yet because it's, it's hard to describe faith. It's a, it's an odd um, personal journey that I'm still trying to figure out. But the, the Catholic faith ended up speaking to me, and I've got to say, I was kind of anti-Catholic in a way um, for a long time. I thought, ah, this whole Rome thing, this Pope thing, confession, oh, it's just, it's silly, ridiculous. And, you know, go back and start reading, you know, the confessions or going back and reading Thomas Merton or the Aquinas. And, and 
it wasn't into it wasn't an intellectual thing but it was a, a combination a spiritual intellectual faith driven and very personal for me and uh, I will write about it someday um, but it was the without a doubt the most important thing I've ever done the best thing I've ever done and without my faith I would not have made it through this summer or certainly this year um, it was a true gift and a blessing and do you know what tripped it I think going through um, my mother's death and and seeing people rally to my side and to her side in that period of time really touched me and in a way that I hadn't I don't know. I hadn't. I, I kind of. I went along in life, and and I don't think I really was giving much thought to immortality or the fact that we're here for a flash. Can you believe C-SPAN won't be here for eternity? Can you even believe that? So you know, we're here for a flash. What are you going to do when you're here? What what difference are you going to make? How how are you going to touch other people's lives? And I think for me, I saw that Christ was working through other people to kind of, you know, reach me. You know, she's going over there. Reach, pull her back. You know, the lost sheep. Uh, so uh, I think I felt like that hand was reaching out to me. And um, I think it was probably triggered by my mom's passing. And that began the searching. I'm still searching, though. I'm, you search every day. Let's go back to your radio show. Um, why is it that, and I don't know where it started. Say it started with Rush Limbaugh, sure. that the, the conservative talk show host took off after the liberal press, in quotes. And that talk show hosts spend a lot of time being angry with the New York Times. Yeah. Why? Well, I don't know about being angry at the New York Times, but I think reminding people who are busy in their daily lives that because it's run under the moniker of all the news that's fit to print doesn't necessarily make it so. I don't think we need to prove now that the media has a liberal bias. I mean, I worked at CBS Evening News. I worked at MSNBC. I've done stints on CNN. I know the folks at Fox. Um, and it's just no doubt in anyone's mind who's been exposed to it that it's liberal. Talk radio, at least what I try to do is, okay, what are you going to do with it and what are you going to do about it? With it, it's fun. I mean, when Dan Rather was saying, not only is there not going to be apology forthcoming, there's not going to be an investigation and, you know, standing behind the document, the, the National Guard document story. It's, it's amusing and infuriating at the same time. And isn't that life? I mean, life is, is funny and frustrating and outrageous at times. And, and, and so bringing those snippets to people, I think, uh, helps, helps some people who otherwise would just look at the headlines, oh, Oh, it's another disaster in Iraq. We're not making any progress there. Oh my good, you know, Judge Alito had said that, you know, abortion wasn't a constitutional right. He shouldn't be on the court. And sometimes it's it's explaining the full context to people who are busy. You know, I often say on our show, you have lives and we don't. So we go through C-SPAN, CNN, Fox, and we find things that uh, we think you'd want to know about. That's why one of the reasons we talk about media bias, because people are so busy, some of it just, they don't notice what's being said or done, and they, there's no reason for them to. Um, but I, we want the New York Times in many ways to be around because it provides unending fun for us. And we'd is, like to see how those people in Manhattan think. You is know, there they, anything good about the New York Times? Oh, yeah. We, and, we, and we do. You know, we highlight uh, reporters and, and stories that you know, do present a, a, you know, a different perspective or sometimes even a conservative perspective. And sometimes we are amazed. The New York Times will do a piece about... Um, uh, homeschooling or something that's that's positive and we often say or Matt Lauer asks a great question or Katie Couric asks a great follow-up to a liberal guest and we'll play the hallelujah chorus saying this is great and so we it is important and I, and I, I see the point you're getting at is that you don't want to be you're not going to get anywhere if all you are is negative 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 that's why you put the great authors on or the great musicians or you know whether it's a Quincy Jones or a Bono that we interviewed or, uh, you know, someone who started, you know, a great organization to help against hunger. And put these leaders on to talk to the people. I learn more from those types of people than I do from politicians. People who are out, out in the world doing something for other people. And, and, and we have to check ourselves because y you can sit around and you get too insular. You're like, oh, it's Dan Rather, New York Times, you know. 
Well, good morning, America. It becomes just a mishmash of, of complaints, and, and that ultimately won't hold an audience, I don't think. That's, that gets, that's, that's as predictable as, as media bias. Where do you think you're going with all this? Well, I hope to uh, launch a career as a, a fashion critic. I'm working on that for the Couture shows in Paris. That'd Actually, they've asked about you. They, they like this whole... They've, Ensemble? Uh, they, they, the whole thing you've done with, with Black. Um, <laughs> they... Uh, <laughs> I, you know, I don't plan ahead, but I do think that there is a real opening out there for um, more conservative-oriented entertainment. You know, Jon Stewart does a great uh, job every night on Comedy Central, but we could get him a lot of clips that would uh, make fun of uh, the Ted Kennedys of the world and, and others in, in the Senate that he happens to somehow miss on a nightly basis. And, so I think that there's a real opening for not just political commentary that's more entertainment kind of focused and funny, but just in entertainment in general. I think there's, a, there's a, about a third of the country that's not going to the movies uh, today for a reason. And I think you're seeing small companies starting that are, uh, that are trying to cater to that crowd. And who knows? I might do something. In the movie world. I hope someday, you know. That's a that's an ultimate acting, fantasy. Acting or producing acting. or directing. Oh God, or, no! Know. That'd be fr people would be running away from the movie screens. I I'm, I'm talking about it with a couple of people, and you know this could be like Matt Damon and Ben Affleck talking about their next film. It'll never happen. I'm not talking about it anymore. I, I just hope that uh, that that what we've done on our show works in radio, and that maybe with the ideas that we come up with and some of the humor that we that we try to um, share with people on a daily basis that that has a broader following. How that happens, you know, I have a, this fantasy about the movie, uh, doing a movie someday, but we'll see. Is your humor planned? Most of it is not, no. You know, when we have these, the, the sound bites of, from all these characters, some, I look, I read them quickly and, and odd things pop into my mind. We've, got, we've still got some video left. Let's. Oh no! If this is about my Angela, I'm walking off the set. Yeah. Has anyone ever walked off the set before? Uh, no, I could be the but first one. But this could be the first. Let's Great. run whatever we have left. Great. Oh, good. Whoops. Host of species long since departed. Mark the mastodon, the dinosaur who left dry tokens of their sojourn here. On our planet floor, any broad alarm of their of their hastening doom is lost in the gloom of dust and ages. That's uh, that's uh, Major, Major Garrett. Major Garrett. What about the news types coming on? And you know, would they? You, you can get some of these big names that would rather appear on Leno or. Letterman or any of these shows, and they would come here and talk. Sure, I mean, it's, I I like putting people like Major Garrett or George Will or Henry Kissinger or or any of these people who you're used to seeing in a particular format, and I like to take them outside of their little box. That's what about television I I sometimes don't like is that you're. You're the conservative radio person. You're over here, and then there's a liberal person, and you're supposed to go nee, 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 and fight each other. I like getting Major Garrett to read, once again, Maya Angelou. And what can he do with it? He has an amazing talent. That guy can do like a Cockney, Christopher Hitchens kind of accent with Maya Angelou and sound like Falstaff at the same time. And it's funny. I mean, I, people are real people with real talents that sometimes aren't displayed. Does your show make news? We made... I. We made news um, on the Dick Durbin Pol Pot comment because Lee was up late at night with his baby named Reagan. His daughter's name is Reagan. Kid you not. Um, Lee's and your producer. Lee, I'm sorry, Lee Habib, my, um, my right-hand man, my producer, was up late at night watching C-SPAN. And that's when Dick Durbin made his comment about Pol Pot and Abu Ghraib. Or the tor and we led the show with it, and then it became... That was probably the most recent example of a time where we highlighted something and then it kind of caught on. And, and I, sometimes that happens. Why has it uh, come in this age, um, 25 years, where people are really calling each other names on talk radio, both sides? Do you listen to Air America? I've listened to it on occasion, but not regularly. I, I've, I've heard a few minutes of, of, of Al Franken. But I mean, it's gotten both on both sides. It's gotten pretty raw. Yeah, I guess. Good or I bad? Mean, Good or bad? Does it matter? Yeah, I don't know. I don't. I go back and look at some of the old, you know, broadsheets, early part of the 1900s, late 1800s. This stuff is vicious. They were accusing people of, you know, sleeping around, having affairs, you know, hiding stolen horses and in their friends' stables. I mean, there was all sorts of things. 
thrown around. So I, I think it's, I think it's all right. Somehow I think the, the republic will survive. But it can't just be that. I mean, and it can't be mean for the sake of being mean. Although we, I'm sure we, we crisscross the line, and sometimes you know you're in a, you forget sometimes when it's good. You forget you're on the radio, and you're just, you're just talking, and you're. You have a website. You have a radio show. You have books. You speak. Um, you make a lot of money. Well, how would you define that? I don't know. I'm not, 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 not going to ask you. I mean, is it? I is do all fine. This, I, I do. I, I yes. I, I do well. I'm extremely blessed. Are you surprised at how well you can do? In this um, I would have made more money as a lawyer, um, at least at this juncture. I think so. I didn't trade in my profession for a more lucrative one yet, but. You know, there's always how much time. Of, of a how much of a push is that for you to make a lot of money? Oh, uh, believe me, if that if, if that's what was important to me, all I would do is churn out books. But I can't, I, I can't just churn out a book a year. For me, that's you know, I, I, it's not. I, I I have to have something I really want to say and something that, that's really moves me to write it because I I have to write it <laughs> and I can't do it just for the money. I just can't. Of all those things, which do you enjoy them? I mean, you just talked about the radio show, yep. but speaking and writing your books and... I like, I like doing my show and I like going out and meeting people. When we go to different cities across the country, uh, it's wonderful. And we, every time I go, whether it's to uh, Minneapolis or Denver or Arizona or um, somewhere in the country, I, I hear some amazing story um, from some some person who shows up who who came from a you know far away who showed up because of X and it's not it's nothing to do with me it's some, some amazing story about that American and it sounds really hokey but something that I heard Tom Wolf say on your uh, interview program when he talked about the nation of parentheses that the parentheses are the coast and that middle part of the country that's America and I get really, uh, I get, to me, it's the best thing is to get out of Washington, get out of your natural habitat, and go meet the people. If you don't meet the people, you forget where you came from. If you get where you came from, then you might as well just pack it up and forget whatever you're doing because you're going to be, you know, you're going to be uh, out of touch with the people who made you successful. Thank you, Laura Ingram. Thanks, Brian. You laughed. I saw it. For a copy on DVD or VHS tape, call 1-877-662-7726. For free transcripts or to learn more about Q&A, visit us at qna.org. Q&A programs are also available as C-SPAN podcasts 